Namaste. So, in the previous episode, which you can watch here, the disciple approaches the master and he inquires, how can one attain self-realization? And basically the master says, you have to inquire into your real nature. So naturally, <laughs> the next question is, how do you do that? So here, Ramana begins a detailed explanation of self-inquiry, which, as far as I know, is not contained in any other work. So <clears throat> this is where it starts to get really interesting and very helpful for one's own spiritual work. Disciple, what is meant by saying that one should inquire into one's true nature and understand it? Master, experiences such as I went, I came, I was, I did, come naturally to everyone. From these experiences, does it not appear that the consciousness, I, is the subject of those various acts? Enquiry into the true nature of that consciousness and remaining as oneself is the way to understand, through inquiry, one's true nature. So, in other words, Inquiry begins from examining the assumptions behind not only our thoughts and words, but our experience. Every time we say, I went, I came, I did, and so on, really we're identifying with the body. And the first principle of this inquiry is that one's true nature is bodiless. That was also covered in the previous sutra. So what does it mean to be bodiless? There are many paths that teach that one is not the gross material body. But most of them identify the self with the subtle material body the mind, intelligence, and false ego. So, the thought, I, instead of referring to the fleshly body, the anamaya kosha, then refers to the subtle body, the pranamaya kosha, or energy sheath, and the manomaya kosha, the mental sheath. So, in this case, one has made a tiny amount of progress, but not really approaching full self-realization. Why? Because the thought, I, is still there. Now, whether one thinks, I, I am, I thought, I know, I saw, huh? whether one thinks of that as a body or as something more subtle. Still, the concept of a separate individual is there. Now, ask yourself this. Without the thought of I, does I still exist? This is something to look into very deeply. Because the I that is a thought is different from the I that really exists. If you can draw this distinction, if you can see the difference between the I that is thought and the I that simply is, then you're getting somewhere. You see, this is viveka, discrimination or distinction between various levels of reality. The I that we manufacture, that we fabricate, basically out of nothing, <laughs> is the false I. It's based on the body, the bodily sensations, the senses, 
and the mind. I thought, I knew, I am so-and-so, the name uh, or the designation. I am from this country, I am in this religion, I am the father of so-and-so or the spouse of so-and-so. These are all bodily thoughts, but they appear to be subtle because they're based on the mind. But let's take a look at that. Where is the mind? When we experience ordinary physical consciousness, jagrat, we are aware of so many things, objects, and those objects appear real. In other words, they appear to have independent existence. But do they really? The scriptures make an example of a clay pot. When the clay is in the ground, it's undifferentiated. Then when the clay is taken out and refined and put on the potter's wheel and turned and made into a pot, then it seems to acquire differentiation. It seems to be a separate object. But then when the pot is broken and it merges back into the ground, the differentiation ceases and we no longer perceive it as a separate object. Well, the same is true of the false ego. <laughs> the aggregates of which the ego seems to be the representative have a beginning a middle and an end. In the beginning, they are just part of the world. They're not differentiated. Only when they're differentiated and put together in a certain way do we say, I am. I meaning the temporary false self, self with a lowercase s. But then when the body dies, and the mind also disintegrates because it's based on the memories that were created in that body, then that differentiation also ceases. And there is no way to tell I am separate from anything else. So the question is, <laughs> if, in, in, as in the case of the clay pot, its apparent differentiation from the rest of the world only exists for a limited length of time. Can we really say that it has independent existence? Not really. And the same is true of the empirical self, the small I. It only exists for a limited time because it's based on the body and the body is an aggregate that is only differentiated from the rest of the world by coming into a certain pattern of organization called life. When that life is finished, it goes out. Just like a candle flame that runs out of fuel or is blown out. Huh? We say the flame went out. But where did it go? It didn't go anywhere it simply ceases to exist as a separate object. And the same is true of this temporary ego, this identity based on the body. So first of all, we have to look into this. When we question ourselves, who am I? We also have to question, what am I? What do we mean by I exactly? Do we mean a certain collection of thoughts? Do we mean a distinction that assumes the permanent existence of this identity? Because if we do, we're going to be very disappointed when it's over. And indeed, this is what happens to most people. The assumption that the pot exists separately 
is based on the false idea that the pot will continue to exist indefinitely. And when the pot is finally broken and merges back with the soil, that assumption is proved false. And it's the same with the ego based on the body. The body arises due to a certain combination of circumstances. The father and mother come together and create a new body. And one enters into that body according to one's karma, according to one's qualification under the modes of material nature. And at the time of birth, one accepts this body as the self with the feeling that, oh, this is going to be around forever. But it's not. This false assumption is one of the greatest causes of suffering because obviously the body is not permanent. This same body changes from a tiny zygote to a fetus, to an infant, to a child, to a young rascal, <laughs> to an adolescent, and finally to an adult, and then gradually to a, a senior, <laughs> a mature <laughs> person, and then it gradually decays and finally dies. This is true of all bodies. Even subtle bodies in the planets of the demigods, in Swarga, don't last forever. They last only until the next pralaya, at the end of the day of Brahma. Even the bodies in the pure creation, in the Vaikuntas, don't last forever, but only until the Mahapralaya, at the end of the creation then they too are destroyed. And what happens to them? They simply disappear, just like the candle that runs out of wax, just like the fire that runs out of fuel, just like the light that is blown out. Gone. As if it had never existed. Just think of all the relationships and friends and other events that have happened in your life. If they exist at all now, they are only memories. They're only impressions. They're only thoughts in the mind. So, isn't it clear? That's what they always were. This body is a thought. This mind is certainly a thought. This life, this identity, this ego, is simply a thought. And thoughts have a beginning and an end. All this elaborate discussion is just to convince you, without any shadow of a doubt, that the assumption that one's present identity is going to last forever is false. Neti neti. This is false. And the same is true of any object in the material world. So we should not repose our faith and trust in that which is inevitably going to disappear. Rather, we should analyze who am I, what am I, that is perceiving these objects. And the next texts will go deeply into that examination. Vichara. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.